Today, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. George Fuchs, a physician scientist with specialty training in pediatrics and subspecialty training in pediatric infectious disease, gastroenterology, and nutrition. Dr. Fuchs joined LSU School of Medicine in 1986 and was on the faculty at the University of Arkansas Medical Sciences from 2001 to 2015. He just recently joined us here at the University of Kentucky, where he's currently a professor in pediatrics. He was seconded and in residence at research institutes in Thailand and Bangkok, Bangladesh sorry, for a 10-year continuous period from, 2000, uh, from 1992 to 2001. His area of expertise is nutrition, low birth weight, diarrheal disease, and infection, including the therapeutic and preventative interactions between micronutrients and infectious disease, malnutrition, and low birth weight. Dr. Fuchs has experience both as an investigator and a director of programs in child and maternal health, maternal health and nutrition case management, community-based public health, program monitoring and evaluation, and operations and programmatic research. He has related to child and maternal health as well as nutrition policy through involvement with a variety of global health organizations such as the WHO, World Bank, USAID, UNICEF, and others. His work has been performed principally in Southeast Asia, South Asia, Latin America, and the United States. He's been published in over 170 peer-reviewed journal articles, working reports, and book chapters. And his um, presentation to us today is a challenge to health systems, the malnourished child with pneumonia in developing countries. Please help me welcome Dr. Fuchs. Sorry to make the read all that. Well, thank you very much. It's uh, really great to be here. And uh, you know, I was mentioning to others that this is really where my passion is in this context of uh, international child health and nutrition. Um, what I was going to describe today is um, this interaction between malnutrition and pneumonia and why it's important to give some attention, and then some gaps in our ability to identify and get these children to treatment. And kind of as a lead up to uh, a, a project we just started, I do want to give you a background of the reason that we're even interested in this topic of pneumonia and malnutrition synergy. The uh, correlating topic is uh, relative to health systems. And it's not just enough to know how to treat a child. You have to structure any program within the constraints, the assets, and liabilities of any given healthcare system. Uh, it does present some challenges. So. Um, Many of you may already know this, uh, are familiar with this slide, but this just describes the numbers of deaths in thousands. So this is uh, uh, here, that would be 2.5 million in Southern uh, Asia, 3.7 million in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, then the rest of the world. Uh, this is per year, uh, and this was in 2000. So we're talking about a lot of kids, obviously. So it's a big problem, no question. When you look at all causes of death in children under five years, um, an underlying nutritional deficit is related in over half of them. So that could be global malnutrition, that might be micronutrient deficiency, zinc deficiency, vitamin A deficiency, and among others. Of course, uh, we don't uh, think with injuries it's probably playing a huge role unless somebody uh, you know, can't think straight and drives their car into a ditch. But, you know, for these other conditions, uh, nutrition has a, a very instrumental um, relationship to these causes of death. When we look at where children are dying, this is something everybody has, is, I think, is quite familiar with. It's the usual kind of uh, areas that we see uh, with underprivileged uh, populations. And you can superimpose on this picture here of the underweight children uh, incidence of, of, of death due to diarrheal disease, incidence of death due to pneumonia, uh, among others. These are where your underprivileged populations are, both in terms of health and socioeconomics. So this is a recurring theme of, these, uh, of this area. I think everybody would recognize this child as being malnourished. You can see the ribs sticking out, quite thin extremities. They also typically have a very flat affect. And it's quite interesting, once they recover, they 
become bright and interactive like we're used to seeing children in this country who are healthy. Now this is a, a type of malnutrition that we refer to as wasting, also called marasmus. Uh, so don't be thrown by the different terms for this. And this is a demonist malnutrition, also called kwashiorkor. And people who aren't used to seeing these kind of children might mistake in that their bellies being kind of full as being, uh, you know, fat and happy. Well, in fact, that's uh, fluid, so it's ascites. And you can look at their extremities, they're still wasted. The hair is sparse or, or missing. They all look like little old people. Malnourished children all look like they're about 80 years old. And so uh, the, the key thing with uh, quash york or demnus malnutrition, in contrast to the wasting, is that this carries a higher mortality rate. They, they die more readily. Now, when we uh, classify malnutrition, and I think it's uh, important just to, to go over this just for a second, um, there are different indices that one can use. But we like to use objective indices, and the, the one that's probably the most accurate and is now, I think, being taken up globally is this of uh, Z-scores. And so uh, this is weight for height. So how much does a child weigh for how tall they are? Similar index as BMI, which is weight for height squared. Height for age, so a deficit here would be uh, um, wasting or marasmus. Height for age, how tall somebody is for their age, if they have a deficit, that would be stunting. And then weight for age is just uh, comparing somebody's weight to all children of that same age. That's a, that's a pretty easy indicator to get. You don't have to go out in the community and weigh, I'm sorry, measure children. Um, so that's sometimes used principally in community-based surveys. But uh, adequate is um, anything greater than minus one. Mild is between minus one and minus two. Moderate, minus two to minus three. Severe is if you are worse than minus three or if you have any edema. If you have edema, you have kwashiorkor. And of course, the weight may be acidic fluid. So any edema, no matter what, how much they weigh, is uh, uh, severe and it's uh, kwashiorkor. Now this is what a z-score is. Average here is zero, okay? And so this is the normal range, minus one to plus one. This is mild overweight. And so it's how far you deviate uh, from average is uh, the basis for this type of classification. Now, we don't, well, certainly we are, many of us are kind of compulsive and like to categorize things, but there's actually a, a practical reason to do this. Uh, it, it predicts risk of morbidity and mortality. So this is uh, actually underweight, and these are different uh, sites where uh, these studies looking at the uh, degree of malnutrition, the risk of death here, and these are the various places this was done. And, and you can see there's a pretty good drop off. And so this predicts uh, fairly well the risk of death and the risk of morbidity, even non death morbidity. Um, when you look at it a little bit more closely in this regard, uh, this is, these are uh, the weight for height z score, so wasting. And as I mentioned, this is normal, this is mild, moderate, and severe. This is the odds uh, uh, ratio, or the odds of, of something happening. In this case, the odds of dying. So if you're one, that means your odds one times normal. So you, you're, there's no increased risk uh, to somebody who has an odds ratio of one. This is, if you're mild, it's about one and a half times likely, more likely to die than if you were well nourished. If you're moderate, it's about three, and if severe, it's uh, over nine times more likely to die. So quite clearly, and this is uh, pretty intuitive, I think you know, everybody would predict that if you're more severely malnourished, you have a greater risk of dying. Now that doesn't mean that if you're not severely uh, malnourished that, that's not, we, that we should not give attention to those who are moderately or mildly malnourished. There's a whole lot more children in the world that are moderately malnourished. So if you look at the absolute numbers of kids who are dying from malnutrition, it's in that group of moderate, moderately malnourished children. So you know, it can be a little deceiving, but when you're deciding which kids to target for interventions, 
uh, certainly you want to target severe, but th th you should give equal attention to those who are, in this case, moderately malnourished because you have the greatest chance of saving more lives. Now, I want to talk a little bit about this interaction between malnutrition and infection, and in the context of today's talk about the interaction of malnutrition and the risk of pneumonia. Uh, this is a slide from the 70s, and it's a simple slide, but it shows graphically a, a very important concept. Uh, this is the age, of, they're following one child, okay? This is one child who they followed as the child got older, and this was the child's weight, and looked at the child's growth in context of the type and number of infections this child got. Children in this context have a lot more infections, not just more severe infections, but a lot more infections in general than children, say, in Kentucky. So these all represent an infectious process. So this is upper respiratory tract infection, the D is diarrhea, and so on and so forth. And as you can see, a child uh, starting out after birth can, can weather these fairly well, but at some point, they start to get so many burdens of infections and it takes a toll on that child's growth that they ultimately become malnourished. And so when a child uh, is, has an infection, those of you who aren't pediatricians will know that uh, these children, they lose their appetite. And if you have several infections a year, that adds up to the point that you do become malnourished. Now, in terms of the interaction between nutritional status and infection, this is a, kind of the, the classic vicious triangle. You could enter anywhere into this triangle in these large groups and still suffer the uh, same consequence. If, for example, you have, are malnourished, you have impa impaired intestinal integrity, so you uh, don't absorb nutrients as well. Uh, there are infections that can attach more readily to the respiratory tract or GI tract mucosa. You have impaired secretion like gastric acid, and that's our first defense against many organisms that cause diarrhea like salmonella. Then you also have an impaired immune function. If you're severely malnourished or moderately malnourished, you are immunocompromised. It's a key, key point. If you're immunocompromised, then of course you have an impaired host defense. You, this may manifest as neutropenia, uh, T cell suppression, or complement consumption. These are elements in the immune response. Interestingly, not so much in terms of immune globulin. In fact, immune globulin levels are often increased in malnourished children, but, but the other components are vitally affected. This leads to more infection. You have uh, increased production of cytokines, which are proteins and other things. With the infection, you mount a fever, you get an become anorexic. You have increased nutritional requirements. You have uh, nu nutrient uh, catabolic losses in the urine and stool. And ultimately, that you know, affects your nutritional status. So in a child that's getting many infections, eventually, you can't sort out whether it's the infection or the nutritional status that's doing the child in. The answer is it's, it's both. So this is the, the, the uh, intense relationship between infection and nutritional status. Uh, and looking at specific nutritional defects, uh, I'm sorry, immune defects as it relates to malnutrition, uh, this is not meant to absorb uh, individually, but, but in general, uh, there are implications in the immune system due to micronutrient deficiencies, like zinc deficiency, vitamin A, among others, and then just general global malnutrition like kwashiorkor and marasmus. And so these, there's been a, a decades of work that, have, that has uh, investigated and sorted this out. Uh, you know, in terms of designing interventions, though, um, it may not be so straightforward. So a micronutrient may be the key element, depending upon what your interest is, in terms, or it might be more global malnutrition. Now, in treating malnutrition, for years, um, there was no progress in terms of decreasing the mortality rate of children hospitalized with severe malnutrition. About 30 to 50% of children 
who were hospitalized with severe malnutrition died. Interestingly enough, when I won't go into this too much today, but uh, the published literature for developed countries like the United States on severe malnutrition and hospitalized children, same mortality rate. Uh, but at any rate, no progress was being made. And um, when we look at the cause of death, there are several possible causes. Uh, dehydration and electrolyte disturbances, in particular things like uh, potassium depletion, magnesium depletion, muscles don't work, uh, the rates of sudden cardiac arrest are very high in that situation, phosphorus depletion, and then fluid overload. Children are often given a lot of fluids because when they come in, you, they look like they might be dehydrated. In fact, you can't tell the hydration status of a mal severely malnourished child because if you're severely malnourished, you look the same as if you were severely dehydrated. So they often will give a lot of fluids and the heart just can't keep up with it. Uh, and that leads to cardiac failure and cardiac arrest. This is a huge uh, cause of death in these kids, un undiagnosed and untreated infections. Children who are immunocompromised don't manifest infections the same way if you are not immunocompromised. So uh, they could have a very profound fever, even bacteremia, and not be afebrile. They might actually be, be uh, uh, hypothermic. Uh, they could have pneumonia, but they don't have white cells sufficient to get to the site. And when you actually have symptoms from pneumonia, it's due to the immune response in the lung. So they could have a florid pneumonia, but not look so, so ill. Then severe anemia, and then uh, independently hypoglycemia and hypothermia. What we do know is that children who are severely malnourished have stereotypical pathophysiologic abnormalities. They have all have potassium depletion. They all have phosphor, phosphorus depletion. Um, they all have sodium excess, even though their serum sodium may be actually a little low. And so if you just treat the child intuitively, like any good physician would, not knowing these uh, stereotypical abnormalities, you, generally you treat it incorrectly. Uh, example would be uh, more familiar in this setting is premature newborns. If a premature newborn has just a little bit of a fever or has some abdominal distension, yes, you culture them up, but you don't wait for the culture results before you start treatment. Same thing here. If you wait for abnormal lab results, the mortality rate's very high. So you needed to use anticipatory uh, treatment, not, not reactive treatment. Um, so this was uh, something that WHO developed in the late 90s. It was a protocolized approach so that uh, every child who came in on day one got this, certain set of interventions, on day two, this. If they had a fever or diarrhea, then they got this. Rather than using the uh, intuitive approach of just uh, that you would normally, because that the intuitive approach was incorrect. And that's sometimes difficult to persuade you know, well-trained uh, healthcare personnel that they, they've got to use this um, cookbook, if you will, kind of approach. Um, and this is what I was describing. This is the acute or stabilization phase, day one. They, uh, these are the issues that uh, uh, need to be looked for. This is a, sp a specific treatment. And then the, the manual goes in d detail what these are. And then once they're out of this danger phase of the refeeding syndrome, then they go into rehab, uh, nutritional rehabilitation phase. Um, and uh, the, then the expect expectations, they recover well. Now, this was not... And those of people working with malnutrition were aware of this, and this made sense, but it, it really was not intuitive to, to most people. So um, I should back up here and just, this is uh, very similar to what I was describing in terms of the initial treatment. Um, this is the focus on the treatment. The stabilization f phase, you don't give them a lot of calories because they metabolically can't handle it. So that, that stabilization phase is sp their specific treatment. Following that, in the rehab phase, there's, there's uh, more aggressive nutritional repletion. Um, this is the context in which, um, you know, I more recently uh, have been working, and it's in uh, Bangladesh, which is this little country here. Dhaka in the middle, you've got India, uh, Southeast Asia, and so forth. For those of you who are geographically challenged, I thought that might help you get you oriented. This is a close-up. Um, this is a DACA. It's a, it's a very um, 
highly densely populated country. It's um, similar to taking half of everybody in the United States and then putting them all in the state of Louisiana. So people are on top of people. It's also a riverine community. You've got the Ganges and Brahmaputra, which are called different, they have different names in Bangladesh, but draining the Himalayas here in the monsoon, most of the country is underwater. And so there's this massive effect of displacement due to floods uh, of these populations. At any rate, in Dhaka, where uh, the International Center for Diarrheal Disease Research, where I was working uh, for seven years, um, we designed a, protocol, a protocolized approach to treating severe malnutrition. And we were developing ours at the same time WHO was working on theirs. And um, I was interacting with the diarrheal disease folks at WHO. And they, one of the, their fellows said, well, you know, our guys in nutrition are working on this protocol. And they're conceptually identical. Uh, again, it's not that we didn't know what needed to be done. It's how do you get that into programs? Uh, because it wasn't, it wasn't intuitive. And so at any rate, we took uh, a group of kids that we intervened with our protocol and looked and compared their outcomes to a group the, uh, for the entire prior year. We did not think it was ethical to randomize them to the usual treatment versus the protocolized approach. We knew it was going to be better. Um, but at any rate, so this was... Uh, it's one of the few non-randomized trials that they published in The Lancet, actually. Um, the key thing here is uh, this bit, mortality rate. So it was reduced by about half. And as this got more ingrained in the hospital, actually in subsequent years, it went down to 5 and then 3%. So there's no question this was uh, uh, a better way to do it. Now, the reason Lancet published this non-randomized trial was because these results validated the WHO protocol. And that facilitated the uptake of the WHO protocol. And the WHO asked us, and we agreed not to call, refer to ours as the ICDDRB protocol, even though we were very proud of it, but we didn't want to confuse people. So the approach really does work. And so uh, this now has become the standard for inpatient, you know, the kids that are severe enough to be hospitalized, treatment. So this is the type of child we would typically see. Again, this flat affect, or even worse, quite malnourished. And th three weeks later, again, it looks like a kid. You know, it's happy. And the difference is, is, is striking. Treating severe malnutrition is one of the more rewarding, visibly gratifying uh, things one can do. Now, I, I want to talk specifically about this interaction of malnutrition and pneumonia. Uh, if you look at the incidence of pneumonia, where pneumonia is most problematic, as I mentioned, it's the same kind of graph as you saw where, where are all the malnourished children, where are all the poor children, where are all the children with diarrheal disease, where are all the ones that are dying. They're all here, sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Uh, this is the incidence of pneumonia and pneumonia deaths in under age five children globally. And... I want to draw your attention to develop, developing countries, and each year, over 2 million children die from pneumonia. Now, I mentioned that there, there, there's this interaction with nutrition. Uh, let me just back up in terms of how pneumonia in this context is defined. This is a very clinical definition, and this is the WHO classification, where you don't have a lot of equipment, you don't have a lot of x-rays, so the definition has to be uh, rather clinical. And uh, depending upon where that child is, in very severe, severe, or just pneumonia, uh, that determines what the management is. Admit to the hospital, admit to the hospital, home care. A lot of these, in fact, are not going to be pneumonia. They may be uh, reactive airway disease, asthma, and so forth. But for somebody out in the field uh, at a clinic or a hospital that doesn't have pulse oximetry, doesn't have chest x-ray, that may not be a, very well may not, probably isn't a doctor, uh, you know, these are healthcare workers, you need this, this, this more basic uh, way to define these conditions. Uh, now, I, I want to come back to this relationship between pneumonia and malnutrition. 
So this is, don't, this is weight for age, this is stunting height for age, and this is weight for height. Let's focus on weight for height. So how skinny is somebody? And if you look at severe, moderate, mild, and normal, and these are odds ratios. So as I mentioned, this is the odds of dying. If you uh, have pneumonia and mild malnutrition, it's one and a half times greater than if you were normally nourished. But if you were, have pneumonia and moderately malnourished, it's four times greater to die. And if you're severely malnourished, it's almost not, which is not surprising. But it does emphasize the point that you can't just focus on treating the pneumonia or you can't just focus on treating the malnutrition. You've got to treat both conditions. When, you, when one looks at the major risk factors, environmental, for uh, uh, affecting acquisition of pneumonia, this is the kind of list that you've got. We, def we know these are definite, we know these are issues, these are likely and these are possible. The ones in blue are, that are highlighted relate to nutrition. So malnutrition you just saw. Low birth weight, which is uh, in Bangladesh, about 40% of babies are born low birth weight, most IUGR. There's a tributal risk factor for malnutrition and early death due to diarrheal disease, among others. Non-exclusive breastfeeding, so uh, babies that are given formula. Uh, maybe the formula is made up with, with uh, contaminated water. Maybe the family's poor and is trying to stretch the formula, so they dilute it. So we know that if you, uh, the babies are not breastfed, that there's a higher risk of mortality. Likely is zinc deficiency in terms of pneumonia. Possible is vitamin A deficiency. Um, we now have a little bit more information on this about these things that are possible and likely. So uh, this is a relationship between vitamin A as treatment, not vitamin A to prevent. So not supplementing children with vitamin A and see if they get pneumonia, but once they have pneumonia in terms of treating a child that comes in to see you with pneumonia in that context. So this is... Uh, uh, the relative, it's similar to an odds ratio, rel relative risk. And so one means there's no increased risk or decreased risk. If, if you fall on this side of the, the graph, it favors the placebo in the study. If it follows this side of this uh, line, it, it, it favors the outcome of those children given vitamin A who had pneumonia. And as you can see, it's not very persuasive, is it, for uh, any positive effect. Uh, so treating children with... Um, pneumonia, treating them with vitamin A, does not appear to be very, a very good strategy. Um, unlike, say, in terms of diarrhea, it might be. Um, in fact, this is a study, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but in essence, it, it's a trial of giving vitamin A or placebo, looking at various measures of severity of pneumonia, a need for oxygen, uh, retractions of how uh, someone is breathing, and, and, and actually giving vitamin A actually had a detrimental effect. So even though these children are malnourished and you think, well, let's just give them a little bit of everything, you gotta be careful that that may not be the right approach. In this case, it, it certainly isn't. Uh, and this happens to be uh, zinc. Again, um, on this one, if the, if the study results in terms of the children who got zinc versus placebo, if they got zinc and, they, uh, and they're on this side of the, uh, I'm sorry, if they got this side of this line, it favored the, getting the zinc versus getting the placebo. And again, there's not, not a very compelling case there for giving zinc to a child that's got pneumonia. This is uh, kind of a, actually, I thought, an interesting report. And it's looking at global malnutrition. The, child, the children that you saw that had global wasting or global um, kwashiorkor. And they looked at, as retrospective, they looked at four time periods. Uh, I should mention that this time period is the WHO protocol that I just described, where they get very specific, very, very programmed feeding, as well as a, a, a mineral and micronutrient supplement, uh, compared to some other time periods at this one facility, where in the, between 87 and 90, they, it was very unstructured kind of a, a approach to treating these kids. Uh, the children didn't eat most of what they were given. There was no multivitamins uh, or micronutrients given. Then the second period where they became a bit more structured, uh, they ensured that the kids ate a certain amount, but still no micronutrients and, and minerals. 
then uh, this period was very similar to the uh, WHO protocol where they got these certain calorically dense fee feeds at certain times of the recovery. However, it didn't have this micronutrient mix and, uh, and mineral supplement. I showed you that vitamin A and zinc by themselves don't seem to have much of an impact, right, on, on outcome. Well, but if you, if you give it in the context of the other nutritional requirements of energy and protein, it does have an impact. And this is the uh, various time periods. This is the equivalent to the WHO with the multi-micronutrient and mineral mix. And you can see these are kids with uh, kwashiorkor and wasting. And you can see there's, there's a, a, a quite, quite a significant uh, difference. So um, I think this points out that, number one, global malnutrition has a integral role in children with pneumonia in terms of their survival. And treating that malnutrition has an integral role. But it would be a mistake just to try to treat them with uh, isolated micronutrients. In fact, you could have a, a detrimental effect. So there's this relationship that's fundamental of global malnutrition and uh, risk of dying with pneumonia. There's also this uh, interaction goes both ways. So this is the risk of, or the effect of pneumonia on nutrition. I showed you the effect of nutrition on pneumonia outcomes. This is the effect of, of uh, pneumonia on, on uh, malnutrition risk. So this is a study in which they had uh, pneumonia cost them 15 grams of body weight a day of illness. Uh, this is any coughing illness. Uh, again, it had an effect on linear growth and uh, weight gain. Again, if you have four or five, six of these things a year, it adds up. Um, this is something that they define as respiratory infection. Even if you got immunized against uh, organisms that cause pneumonia, then those individuals who got immunized even those in pregnancy and conferred that immunization protection to the infant, you had a positive effect. So this, this uh, goes both ways. Now, um, in terms of this pneumonia and malnutrition interaction, um, as I showed you, both malnutrition and pneumonia independently will have an impact on morbidity and mortality. But together, they are synergistic. So they have an additive effect. And so this is a, a key concept. We know from, from what we know from pathophysiology and physiology of micronutrients and malnutrition and infection, it makes sense. I mean, it, it, it really isn't a surprise. Um, and again, this final point that global malnutrition rather than individual micronutrient or mineral deficiency uh, seems to be the key player here relative to nutrition, undernutrition, and risk of pneumonia and dying from pneumonia. And so obviously then you would conclude that if the maximal aggressive therapeutic intervention would be directed at both, not just one or the other. And you would expect that to yield the optimal survival. And again, don't forget, we're talking about you know, a couple million kids a year, so it's not a small, small issue. Now I want to come back and talk a little bit about what we're doing in Bangladesh right now and what, what has led up to that. Um, this comes back to the definition uh, and the recommendations of what to do with children who have very severe, severe, or just pneumonia. Okay, all admit to the hospital. And that's not terribly surprising. These kids are really quite sick. And this is independent of malnutrition. Um, so the options, when, uh, you know, depending upon severity, is treat them in the community. So if a child has uh, non-severe pneumonia, there may be a village health worker in the healthcare system or a community health worker, and they may have very rudimentary knowledge of, of these uh, definitions of pneumonia and may then dispense an antibiotic and treat them in the community. The other option, of course, is facility-based. And that's usually reserved for the children who are more severely ill. Makes sense. They may need pneumonia. They may need pneumonia. They may need oxygen. Uh, may need parenteral IV or IM antibiotics, uh, among others. 
Um, unfortunately, this is the situation that uh, is the predominant situation in most uh, developing countries, is that there are really significant access issues to getting into the hospital for those kids who need it. And when I was in Bangladesh, before I left, and we were very, very happy that that protocol worked, and, but then it was, became very obvious that we weren't getting most of the kids that needed uh, needed this protocol, and we knew that they're just the mortality rate had to be extraordinary, and so um, you know there were various reasons they weren't getting the hospital care: lack of hospital beds. Uh, the mothers are usually required to stay in the hospital with the children. They're actually instructed how to feed the kids, and they participate in the care. So if the mother's not there, the children can't be hospitalized. And then there's just uh, some practical constraints. The distance traveled, and some, if it's in the urban area, just getting through the traffic can be a constraint. You've got to pay to get to the hospital. Uh, the mother has other household chores to feed the other children at home, feed the, uh, feed the wage earner. Sometimes the mother is the wage earner. If she's in the hospital, she's losing wages. So these are really practical constraints that you know, we, we quite clearly were not treating most of the kids that, that needed it. Um, this was, these are pictures of, the quality may not be great, but uh, last time I was in DACA last June, uh, in the context of our study, this shows only two children per hospital bed. Actually, it was not uncommon to have three and four. And sometimes there were just not enough hospital beds that uh, the children just could not be admitted. And so this, these children may not have the same illness. One might have diarrheal disease, one might have uh, infection to, uh, say, RSV, pneumonia. This might be something else, and they're exchanging their infections. Um, but this is really qu quite the norm, particularly in uh, epidemic seasons, you know, during the time of the year. Around here, winter's uh, quite, a, quite notable for that. So and in transport, uh, it's not a matter of just getting in your car, you know, and driving to Chandler Hospital. It's, you know, in the mega cities, which are now the norm, in DACA, for example, I mean, you could be stuck in traffic just to go a mile to take it three hours. And if you're in a rural area, you might have to, you know, get on a boat and, go, you know, not to mention the cost of this. So these are real, uh, real constraints. So um, the concept we came up with was pretty simple, actually. Um, and that is, uh, might we be able to uh, extrapolate what we've done on the in, in, uh, in hospital setting to an outpatient setting. Uh, would that be, could you do that without excessive danger to the, the child? Um, what would be the, the cost implications to the healthcare system and to the, the people? And so uh, the daycare approach is here as compared to the hospital approach. So this is, uh, again, investigational. These are sick kids, by the way, really sick kids. You never do this, uh, say, in the United States, try to cheat the, treat these children uh, as an outpatient. So this is pretty standard. Um, Hospitalization is unnecessary, obviously, in the daycare. They come in during the day, get treated, go home at night, and then come back the next day. Um, this, is, at least, this is the duration of a stay. Costs we knew would be less expensive, and this would be more expensive. Of course, now we had to factor in the cost uh, to the families of transportation. So the cost analysis was actually much more extensive than I've just described, but it, it had to take into account all the costs to the healthcare system as well as to the families, direct and indirect. Um, of course, access to healthcare would be much more readily available in the daycare approach um, than the hospital approach and was the driving force to actually testing this. So the first thing we did was... Uh, tested this uh, in terms of the treatment of children who are severely malnourished. You saw the pictures of them. Most of them have an infection, pneumonia, diarrhea. These are sick kids. So it wasn't without some trepidation that we did this. Now, this was an ep uh, efficacy trial. So we actually um, had criteria that if the child was, had a certain degree of illness, uh, that we could not send them home. Um, we also, if they did not come back, we went after them. Okay, just from an ethical standpoint, we felt we needed to do this. And so the first one we did was uh, with severe malnutrition. We 
partnered with an NGO who was working in the community and they helped identify the children through nutritional surveillance. The other partnering institution was a uh, NGO, non-governmental organization that was running a daycare facility. And then the DACA Children's Hospital. Uh, so this was not involving our research hospital. You know, we didn't want that would be a little bit too artificial uh, favoring whatever we did or impacting what we did. And so uh, the children were randomized to either the daycare or hospitalized care. Certain criteria, if they failed one, they would then go to the hospital. They failed daycare. If they failed the hospital care, they would go to a specialized pneumonia hospital or a diarrheal disease hospital, depending upon the, the situation. And so when we look at the, uh, the outcome, uh, the children that were uh, treated in the daycare management had a sur uh, survival rate, successful, not survival, but success rate, uh, which had predefined uh, criteria, uh, definition, about 80%. Um, these, this is left against medical advice. Uh, and then about 6% had to be referred uh, because they failed the daycare approach. So and it worked. Largely, it, it largely worked, and it was non-inferior to the uh, hospital care. Uh, we then looked at uh, the same approach with severe pneumonia, not end malnutrition, just severe pneumonia. And um, let me just take you through the key points here. This is uh, those in daycare versus hospital success. Uh, this is those with, with or without hypoxemia. The bottom line is if they did not have hypoxemia as measured by pulse oximetry, um, that, the, the, the outcome was uh, the same. The daycare children survived. Six, yeah, the mortality rate was no difference. It wasn't powered for mortality, but the success rate of treating the pneumonia was the same. Now, there were more of them that failed uh, in the daycare approach if they were hypoxemic. Okay? They had to be referred. Um, but if you looked at this in the context of the healthcare system, then that's not so bad. So if you, have, you, know, if you just only had daycare versus hospital care, then yes, you could not accept that degree of failure. But if you then used the whole healthcare system, then the hospital was reserved for those children who failed the day, daycare. Uh, one of the key outcomes actually was this here, was that uh, it's about a third less expensive. And when you scale that up in budgets, that's quite significant. And so that means the money that's being spent on hospital care, a third of the money could be diverted to something else, maybe vaccines or whatever. So it was non-inferior, but it was a lot, quite a bit less expensive. Um, I actually just changed these slides this morning because the, when I'd given this talk before, we were still in progress of this study. It's just been completed. These are children that have both pneumonia and malnutrition, the ones that are at the highest risk. And I apologize for this, but I did the best I could in a little bit of time. Um, uh, this is the, the, the outcome. And, uh, and if you look at uh, the ones that were successfully managed or had to be referred, if, uh, this is the data. And again, it reflects what, what I just showed you with the pneumonia. But if you looked at, in, in total, the, the entire healthcare system, uh, that uh, it, it actually was equivalent. And so we thought that was very, very encouraging, that if, uh, if it was structured properly, that um, you could achieve these same uh, outcomes as if they were hospitalized. It was a third less expensive to the healthcare system. I didn't even show you the data to the, uh, to the families. It's quite a bit less expensive. In fact, in the randomized control part of this efficacy series of efficacy trials, we had difficulty sometimes with some families. They, they said, no, we, want to do, we don't want to go to the hospital. We want to do the daycare. We said, well, you can't. You know, so, um, so it really had some uh, advantages for the family. Um, so based on these series of study, we felt that protocolized management, of course, is, is efficacious. We knew that. It's preferred by the users. It's also less, less costly. So... What, what's the next steps following these efficacy trials where we control the situation, okay? Uh, well, one, we wanted to have a dissemination and acti uh, advocacy uh, activity, and then we, we needed to do an effectiveness trial, and I'll explain the, what that is, as opposed to the efficacy trial that we did. 
And then, obviously, uh, if it works in the effectiveness trial, then uh, get it into policy and programs. So we had this, um, this symposium and workshop where we reviewed the current state. The workshop then was uh, defined research priorities and program priorities. And it was, uh, this is the group that uh, uh, sponsored this, this workshop. So it was some of the usual players in uh, international health circles and GOB is government of Bangladesh. And, um, so it was quite clear we needed to do an effectiveness trial. Now, the difference between efficacy and effectiveness, everyone might not be aware of that. Uh, efficacy is if you have a controlled situation. Um, effectiveness is in the real world situation. And the, kind of the example I like to use is let's say you have an antibiotic that cures pneumonia, 90%. But when you put it in the programs, um, they may not be able to maintain the cold chain for the antibiotic or they may not have IV sets in the clinic. So if you look at the actual impact, it's not very high. So I felt very strongly we needed to do this before the pro program started taking up this daycare approach. It might not work in, in real life constraints. And uh, this just kind of describes the difference between efficacy and effectiveness. Um, you really don't have much control. You have all comers in the effectiveness trial. Um, and this just uh, describes, you know, how, where in an effectiveness trial you can have uh, diminishing results uh, in terms of the results that you had with the efficacy trial. Access may be a problem. Okay, it works great, but not everybody has access to the intervention. Uh, the providers may not be compliant, so the healthcare provider may not follow the protocol. Say, well, we don't need this. We do it this way. Uh, and then patient adherence and compliance. And if you look at the, the ultimate effectiveness, it's not very effective. So what we're doing now, and the study we just started uh, last spring, is um, scaling it up in four sites in Bangladesh healthcare system. And it kind of, when I say Bangladesh healthcare system, it kind of implies there's one healthcare system. It's really much more heterogeneous than that. But um, we randomize the, cluster randomize the villages and, uh, to hospital care or the um, daycare, but in the context of the other aspects of the healthcare system. So, for example, in the urban areas, there are community health workers who, as I mentioned, would give antibiotics. Uh, in, the, in the hospital arm, if they have severe pneumonia, they've given antibiotics by the healthcare worker. If they fail the oral antibiotics, then they're hospitalized. If they have very severe pneumonia, according to the WHO criteria, they're automatically hospitalized. Well, in the intervention clusters of the daycare approach, uh, we don't want to interfere with this aspect, certainly. So we only take those who fail this. Instead of going to the hospital, they go to the daycare approach. And the ones with very severe automatically go to the daycare approach rather than the hospital. Um, and then if they fail that, they go to the hospital. And a similar kind of approach in the rural areas. There are different entities that manage the rural healthcare system versus the urban healthcare system. This is pretty, pretty common in developing countries. So this is the, this is the next step, and uh, so we've just started this, and we're, we're, we'll see where we go with it. If it uh, does, um, if it does continue to maintain uh, non-inferiority in terms of outcome, but it's less expensive, that that would be, I think. Uh, that be, we'd be very gratified by that. I think it would have significant impact. So I think I'm going to stop here. Uh, sorry if I went through it too fast, but I had a lot of slides, but I'd be happy to take any questions, and I appreciate your, your attention. <laughs> Thank you. How does this compare to what happens in the rest of the world? Do you have any feel for that? Well, most of the developing countries use the... Integrated uh, Management of Childhood Illness, IMCI, and the approach that, uh, and that's in theory, of course. Uh, and the approach, the interventions that are being used here are those. It's, um, this uh, obviously has um, a different context in which we're implementing these. So I think these kind of issues are pretty common in the least developing countries. I mean, it's pretty common. 
Um, in fact, when we were when I was designing this trial, uh, the one of the lead donors of the efficacy trials wanted to well, let's do it in Bangladesh and then let's do it in Cambodia. And I said, well, you know, I mean, just in, indicating that these are pretty common constraints in healthcare systems in developing country. I thought it was a bit much to to take off to try at this stage, but it's very common, very common. Yes. Yeah, uh, the question was uh, the level of training that the healthcare providers have and how readily can that be replicated. <clears throat> well, I didn't go into details about that. The community health workers who dispense oral antibiotics uh, may be a neighbor who's given rudimentary training to identify pneumonia. Once they go to a facility, it depends on, uh, there often are some doctors. There are not enough of them. So uh, they've got a patient load you can't imagine. Um, so depending upon where in the healthcare system the interface is of the child with the healthcare system, they have different levels. With the daycare approach, it's using that, it's using it's in their healthcare system. So it's using these same personnel. Uh, it's just the protocol to treat them as a as an outpatient is what they've been they're being taught. Okay, and the ones in the daycare are going to be the higher level. They're the facility, semi-facility based. Um, but the uh, the community health workers have the rudimentary training. They're they're the community health workers that are there. The people in the facilities are the people who are there now. And so, in terms of replicability, you know, I think uh, we'll find out. But the constraints will be really cost, um, I think, and you know the um, demand and burden placed on, you know, the the, uh, the healthcare providers. Most of, uh, many of these even facilities are the care is provided by non physicians that may different levels of supervision by physicians. Okay, the WHO protocols as you may know are very are written for non-physicians and physicians alike. And they're very cookbook. You do this, you do this, you do this. And so uh, I think if this were to work, I think it would be replicable. There would be a level of training. But the key thing with any type of uh, you know, uh, possible change in the existing healthcare system in mode of delivery is the burden that it's placing on that system. It's not like people have extra time. It's not like they have extra money, okay, to do things. So you can't go in and say, well, we're just going to give them all these, this better antibiotic and put them on ventilators. They can't afford it. So this was designed to, to and when it was designed in that workshop, we had uh, people from NGO communities who were out there delivering care from the government healthcare system who are out delivering care, and they had a role in the design of the trial. So we anticipate that it'll, it'll, it'll be feasible. And we're doing, as I mentioned, I didn't show it, uh, but we're doing very, uh, fairly elaborate health economics analysis uh, to the healthcare system and to the, the families. It, it may not be, it may not work, but the last thing we would want uh, you know, it's them to implement something like this and find out they've wasted this money and wasted this time that they could, they could have. I mean, for every, every for every dollar you waste here, a kids die. So you know, you know, it's not what you. So I think the effectiveness trial you have to do. Is there a possibility to move daycares to areas or to uh, neighborhoods that have higher coverage? 
Well, I mean, these are terrific questions. Uh, that goes into the analysis. So the travel cost goes into the negative side of the ledger. Um, the cost saving of wages goes in the positive side. So when you look at all these variables, that's where we came up. Well, the, the data I showed was the healthcare system. I didn't show you the, the cost savings to the uh, families. Um, so yeah, that all has to go into it if you're gonna look at this honestly. Um, and your other question about push, putting these, the, the distance from the, these are all within the, the community of the, you know, uh, uh, some proximity to the residents. It may be five kilometers or so. You know, but if you're going through five kilometers of that dense traffic in the you know, urban area traffic jam or having to take boats and whatever to get to that, I mean, that, that, that distance is a little bit longer, feels longer than it might otherwise. And the idea is that you know, in the existing healthcare system, it's structured so that there are, uh, and I went through it quickly, so it didn't perhaps appreciate it, but there was this other level, uh, this uh, box here was like the PESHC, I forget all the acronyms, but that would be like a, you know, a place where, P, a physical place where people come, get a little bit more extensive evaluation uh, as opposed to a hospital. And so uh, the, all the areas are divided up into these units. And so each unit may be the, the county unit, what's equivalent to that versus district or state. They've got X number of uh, hospitals, X number of these other level facilities, X number of these community health workers. So um, the point is though relative to uh, the advantage of a daycare is that, or disadvantage to a daycare is there is some distance to traverse uh, or to the hospitals, the same, same issue. Um, actually the daycare units we, we are using or set up for the study are in existing hospitals, many of them. So it's just an area that's now you know, designed for the daycare approach. Well, in the efficacy trial, uh, we went out and got them. Here, from an ethical standpoint, now about 95% of Bangladeshi households have cell phones. Uh, they do their banking. This what's really revolutionizing. So, um, you know, we anticipate we'll be able to contact them. Um, you know, that, that does introduce a variable that, you know, he's not going to have, right? And uh, if you then just... Uh, ramped it up programmatically. You're not going to necessarily go after them. But we felt from an ethical standpoint for this, we, we would have to do that. Now that may go in and constitute a failure you know, of the system, you know, if they don't come back. But uh, that's how, that's, yes, we do have a concern for that.